war, corruption, a government of, by, and for the powerful elite, while Americans every single day who are struggling all across the country are not heard. How do we make this change? Is the answer more politics as usual? No. no. What's the answer? Politics. No, that's actually not true. <laughs> the, an the answer is we the people. The answer is we the people. That is what makes the difference. That is how we go from being in a place of anxiety and fear and stress and living in, in the darkness of this shadow that's hanging over us to walk out into the light and say, you know what, nobody's gonna do this for us. When our founders wrote the Constitution, they were very intentional about those first three words. We the people. It wasn't we the Democratic Party, it wasn't we the government, it wasn't we the Republican Party, it was we the people. So that we never forget that this Democratic Republic belongs to us. And that our leaders never forget who they work for. But unfortunately, that's where we're at now. You have leaders in Washington from both political parties so busy bickering and fighting with each other that they have forgotten that they work in the people's house. And that their responsibility, that their responsibility is to serve the people. Uh, we were just in Virginia recently, and we had a couple of nights back-to-back -to -back town halls, and I met a couple who came to uh, one town hall, and they said, oh, our daughter lives in the area where you're going to have your next town hall the next night. She's not sure if she wants to go because she hates politics. You know what I told them? So do I. <laughs> I said, well, she and I have a lot in common, I promise. Who feels me on this one? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. Why is it? What is it that we hate about politics of today? It's lost its heart. It's lost the people. The politics is not about how we serve the people. The politics is about power. It's about corruption. It's about greed and influence and putting selfish interests ahead of the interests of service to the people. Because what is at the heart of this country, who makes this country great, is us. It's we the people. And we have the ability right now, at this very moment, to shape the kind of future we need to see. To shape the nation that we are proud of and that we love. That's in our hands. It's about the people. It's about those kids I got to hang out with this morning. It's about our loved ones, those who may be sick or in need of care and worried that they can't pay the doctor's bill and are therefore going without their medicine. It's about our planet, making sure that we have one that sustains for generations to come. It's about those words in our Pledge of Allegiance, that we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We know all too well that as powerful as those words are, that is not the country that we live in today. It's about fighting for that justice, fighting for that equality, fighting for that fairness for every single American, regardless of your race or ethnicity or gender or orientation. It's about celebrating who we are. So who are we? 
what is it that binds us all together? Freedom. The values and principles enshrined in our Constitution that says, even if you are of a different party than I am, even if you have different ideas on how to solve a specific problem, even if you and I have strong disagreements, even if what you say makes me mad, I will put my life on the line for your right to say it. That is what binds us together. That is where our strength comes from, that we recognize that with those freedoms that we hold dear, that an attack against one of us is an attack against all of us, and that we take that stand not being complacent, not allowing these freedoms to be undermined by the cancel culture police. <laughs> the change that we need to see, it's about us. It's not about me. It's not about any politician. It's about you. It's about every single one of you. It's about those you hold most dear in your lives. It's about our country and what we want this country to represent, both for all of us here at home and the values, the message, the example that we want to set for other countries in the world. It's about respecting and honoring the service of our men and women in uniform and their families. If we have veterans, family members here today, please let us honor you. If you don't mind, please stand or wave your hand as you're able. Let us thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So many of my friends, as veterans, hate to be recognized. They hate to be thanked, because it's not why they serve. It's not why they make that decision to say, if called, if there is a threat to the safety and security and freedom of the American people, send me first. I will lay down my life to defend and to protect. So I know Cody talked a little bit about peace and foreign policy. We talk often about the cost of war and who pays the price this change that we all are here to seek to bring about has very much to do with those who pay that price. Those who pay that ultimate price, making that great sacrifice, leaving their Gold Star family members at home. It's about those who come home, having difficulty going through what that transition looks like to find some sense of normalcy in this new life. But it's about every single one of us. Every single one of us, whether you realize it or not, you're paying the price for so many of these wasteful regime change wars, going and toppling dictators in other countries, the nation building that follows, this new Cold War escalating tensions between the US and Russia and China, this nuclear arms race, the FAMs are being flamed, new nuclear weapons are being built, all of which don't make us any safer and cost us tremendously, cost us in American lives and taxpayer dollars. So even as some people still throughout this campaign will ask, 
why do you focus so much on foreign policy? They say, Tulsi, you're a one-dimensional candidate. That's all you talk about is foreign policy. Well, guess what? We're in a situation right now, we have a very specific example of how foreign policy is domestic policy. Foreign policy is domestic policy. So as... So what, what is the number one thing that is in the news right now? today, over the last few days, the last week? Coronavirus. Something big happened in Afghanistan today as well. It's not in the headlines, but it should be. But coronavirus, right? This is something that, that I've been very concerned about. We're all concerned about. Everybody's washing their hands, right? Yes? Because this is a serious threat, though. This is a serious threat. And as we've seen over the days and weeks that this threat has been increasing, in my home state of Hawaii, here in California, there have been a drastic shortage of testing kits for those who should be tested, people who are sick, people who have symptoms, people who have been exposed. And the criteria that's been set for who is allowed to be tested is so narrow and so limited, and we're told it's because there's not enough test kits. Why is our government nickel and diming these test kits at a time when there is a great threat to the safety and health and well being of the American people? It's insane. It's insane. We are we're the United States of America. We have the greatest doctors. We're here, we have Silicon Valley, we have innovators, entrepreneurs, people who are coming up with the next amazing creations. Yet we're in a situation, we're here in California, as you well know, you had someone who wanted to get tested, was told no because she didn't meet the criteria, had to wait four days, finally she got tested, had to wait four more days only to say, hey, the test became, was positive with coronavirus. How many people were exposed throughout that period of time? You go to South Korea, they have drive-in stations where you're not feeling well, I'll drive up, take the test, drive off. You're not exposing anyone, you get the instant results. So not enough test kits, why not? Nickel and diming here at home, needlessly putting people at risk while we're spending $4 billion a month in Afghanistan. Five million dollars per hour. Foreign policy is domestic policy. You can't separate the two. And there is a direct correlation to the leaders that are, to the decisions that our leaders are making when they blindly turn their eye and allow our taxpayer dollars to continue to go to pay for these wars that do not make us any safer, and have the gall to come in and tell us we don't have enough money to make sure that you and your family are safe. This should make every single one of us angry. The first responsibility, the first responsibility that every one of our leaders has is to protect the safety and health and well-being of the American people. Do what is necessary. Figure it out. Make it happen. This is one of many examples of why this sea change in our foreign policy is so necessary. Because I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of hearing people say there's not enough money. Not enough money for health care. Not enough money for education. Not enough money to protect our environment. Not enough money for criminal justice reform. Not enough money for infrastructure. Not enough money to pay our teachers. Not enough money for our first responders. Not enough money for our scientists. There's not enough money to take care of you. But guess what? 
There's always enough money for the military-industrial complex, the powerful lobbyists in Washington, the people who are profiting off the backs of hardworking Americans every single day. This is at the heart of the change that we must bring about. This is at the heart of the message that we need to send to Washington on Tuesday. This is up to you. This is up to us. This is up to us. What action will each of us take to make this change? Because this is a time where we have to step out of our comfort zones. We've got to step out of our little circles. Every one of us, if you care about the things we're talking about, if you care about your community, you care about this country, now is the time to think, how can I do more? Who in my cell phone contact list have I not called yet? Which one of my Facebook friends have I not sent a message to yet? We only got a couple of days here in California where you have the opportunity to impact the momentum in this election. The challenges are great. We know this. From the very first day that I started my campaign, we saw how the powerful elite and the corporate media immediately tried to undermine this people-powered campaign. We're still here. We're still here. They can't shut us up. They can't silence us. And we're here because of you. We're here because of so many of you who are chipping in five bucks whenever you can. We're here because of so many of you who are making those phone calls, who are active on social media every day. For those of you who don't live on Twitter, you're talking to your coworkers and your friends and your family. We're here because of the increasing volume of the voices of the people. And this is the most important thing we have to remember. I just went back and reread a few of Dr. King's speeches. And he talked about in one of those speeches how we will march on. We will not be distracted. We will not allow those who put obstacles before us to even allow the doubt in your mind to say, all right, I guess we'll go home. We must march on because there is so much at stake. This fight doesn't end on Tuesday. It must continue. It must continue. Because the change we are seeking to bring about goes far beyond just Democrats versus Republicans. It goes far beyond the tribalism of us versus them. It goes far beyond the divisiveness that is tearing our country apart. It is at the core of our hearts about every single one of us, every single day, making that conscious choice that we will be that light, that we will heal that divide, that we will stand together as Americans, recognizing that when we do so, and as history has shown us, when we do so, we can accomplish anything. We can accomplish anything. It's up to us. So before I open it up to our conversation here, I felt it was important to start on this note because there have been challenges and it's easy to feel disheartened. 
It's easy to wonder about what happens next. Where do we go? That answer lies within our hands. It lies within our hearts and the choices that we will make that will every day shape the future of this country that we love. Thank you all so much for your support and for being here today. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, have a seat. We've got a few microphones. I want to hear what's on your mind. Uh, answer any questions or concerns that you have. We'll try to keep them as brief as possible to get to as many people as possible, given the time that we have. Uh, we've got a couple of mics. Where are the mics at? If you could raise your hands. Here's one. Here's two, three. Awesome. Uh, yes, ma'am, we'll start with you. Hi. Hi. My name is Tallulah. Tallulah, so nice, nice to, to meet you. Today. Um, so you have been very loud about climate change, which I really appreciate because it hits close to home to you in Hawaii. Um, and thank you. <laughs> and I, I mean, study after study shows us that we won't be able to mitigate the worst effects of climate change if we don't address the effects of animal agriculture. And this is an issue that I don't really see talked about by any of the Democratic candidates. But you, of course don't shy away from tough issues as much as other people do. So I thought you might actually be able to give me a straight answer today. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your plan for, for that. And also, I was wondering if you would ever be willing to set an example for the American people um, and go vegan. Um, and if not, uh, how do you reconcile that difference between the principles you espouse and the principles that you actually live by? It's a really great question, Tallulah. And it's one that I think should be asked of leaders in our country who are speaking up about their concerns about climate change, because it really does come down to this point where we can't just talk anymore. What, what are you doing about it? Both as an individual, what are we doing about it as individuals? And what must we do collectively uh, as a country? And you're right, there's a lot of attention focused on fossil fuels. Rightly so, the transition that we need to make towards a uh, clean renewable energy economy, 100% clean renewable energy economy. But so much of the, in, the environmental threats that we're facing do come from this massive uh, industry of animal agriculture and factory farms, both here in the United States and around the world. And the point that you bring up about diet and making those choices about what kind of industry you are supporting, I am supporting or not, uh, is essential. This really was brought to the forefront when those, those terrible fires in the Amazon were on television every single day and people here in the United States, people around the world were crying and heartbroken about how the lungs of the world were being destroyed. Very few of those headlines actually included the reason why they were being destroyed, though. That Brazil is the number one exporter of beef in the world. And so if you look at what the demand is, they are clearing all of those trees to be either be able to grow feed or to have areas for grazing. Direct correlation there. Um, I am already vegan. Answer to your question. I've been vegetarian my whole life, more recently transitioned to being vegan, largely because of understanding what the consequences are of so many of these factory farms, not only in the broader scheme that you're referring to, but I've been through some of these communities whose waterways are completely polluted because of factory farms. The air is difficult to breathe because of those factory farms. The very direct impact that it's having on those communities who are they themselves working to pass local legislation to put a moratorium on these factory farms because otherwise they'll be forced to leave their homes. 
Uh, I think leading by example is important, and those personal choices that I've made um, are largely built around my concern for the impact that these industries are having on our planet.